Bill, tell us a little bit about uh, how did you, you, you went from, from studying engineering to one day going to Wayside Chapel and volunteering at Wayside Chapel. Uh, and you went and, and did the things that Wayside Chapel does. And that seems to have sparked something in you, uh, something that kind of then became a desire to call a call to ministry. How did that happen? Well, it's a long, lot of cutting it all short, right? Um, I was, I was, I was studying single crystal silicon, and we made touch telephones and all those sorts of things. And I used to go down the Sydney domain. And there was a speaker there, some of you remember, called Webster. And I got really interested in what he was saying. And he said one night he was going to the Wayside Chapel. So I went there and a whole lot of things. And ended up running the coffee shop there, for one of the things I was doing. And Ted Noss, who was the minister, he, I used, there used to be a, a, a Sunday night service kind of thing, which was based a lot on the hippie colonies of San Francisco because Australia had the biggest hippie colony outside of San Francisco. It was huge. And um, um, so I was doing all this stuff and he used to get me to read the, the Psalms and it was must have had a big effect, you know, just dealing with homeless kids and runaway kids and alcoholics and all the ups and downs and everything. And I was coming one afternoon or one evening to run the coffee shop and it was up a first flight of stairs. So I got to the landing to go turn around to walk up and it was like time stood still, just bang. And it must have been an instant, but it seemed like forever. And there was like a voice. It wasn't a voice. It was like a voice, but it was a knowing really. And it said, you've got to leave your job. You've got to come and work here. You've got to always work with the poorest of the poor. The work will be long and hard and arduous, but keep going. You'll become well-known, but don't worry about that. Oh, and by the way, the cost will be your personal life won't be that happy, right? And I knew it was true because if you hear most of the Christians who say that sort of thing happened to them, it's all rainbows and glory be and all of that. And it wasn't for me at all. It was it's going to be hard. It's going to be bloody hard. And um, so I knew it was true. And so I had to go to AWA and resign. And they were really annoyed. They paid me the basic wage while I was at university. And um, had to resign. That freaked them out. My family freaked out. Gee. My dad disowned me, really. And I went and um, saw Ted and I said, I've got to come and work for you. And he said, what's the least amount of money I can pay you? <laughs> and there was a commune starting for $10 a week. So I said $11 a week. So I did that for years for $11 a week. Bang. And it changed my life completely. And every time it's got hard something has happened every time and my personal life hasn't been that happy either <laughs> but you work through it so so in a sense it, it's kind of it almost was a, a miraculous call uh so something something that came out of out of the blue out of out, out of out of compared compared to what what you were imagining it was going to be or your life was going to be it changed it completely well, I was kind of going through the motions of being religious, you know. So I didn't have any expectation at all. It was just bang, bang. And I've been trying to work this out all this time. And it was only about, oh, a year ago, or no, less than that, this year. Because I do psychotherapy. I think everybody should have a good shrink. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody on earth should have a good shrink. And... I do psychotherapy and I was saying, why the bloody hell did that happen to me? And the therapist said it really clearly. He said, because the source behind that voice knew you'd carry it out. And it, that's what happened. 
I did it. It's, you, you brought up some, an interesting thing for me because I suppose part of my problem with where the church is going uh, is that we've realized that we have to stop being religious, is that we actually have to start being spiritual. We have to start actually making a difference. Otherwise, people aren't just going to come anymore. And so what we're seeing is, is, is that, that antagonism against religious. Is that How would you define religious versus spiritual in your own mind? You've got to be real. You've got to be real. The, Thomas Merton said the search for God is really the search for yourself. And I think that's really true. You've got to be real. And if we're really honest, most of what we're brought up with is, on society is lies. We're brought up with a series of lies which we will die for. And um, um, once you get look behind the lies that society has, you start to look at the lies you live by, and then you really start to examine yourself. And then it really gets interesting. That's when it gets really... And honesty, total honesty. Now, honesty changes as times change, but to be as transparent as you can without doing damage to people you love, if you get what I mean, the transparency. That's what, how I define it. And um, just being real. Like the thing that gets me about Jesus in lots of ways is he was real, absolutely real. You know, he didn't go along with what other people said or should have said or whatever. He just was himself, was himself. The only other person I know like that is the Dalai Lama, where it's, he just is who he is, you know. Bringing up the, the Dalai Lama, you, you've, you've had opportunity both through your radio show and, and through, through other things in your life to, to uh, have met a number of these people who've, who've had an impact on you. Who would be some of the people that particularly had an impact? And what was that impact for you? Oh, I was talking to the Dalai Lama one day and I said, who are you? Because we'd been in this thing and a lot of the monks will fall to their feet and kiss his feet as they walk by. And he looks at me and gives a standard line like, um, I'm just a simple monk, right? I said, no, you're not. No, you're not. Who are you? And he looked at me and he said, I am the teaching. And it was like looking right through him to the Buddhist Dharma. And at the same time, it was a funny thing, I was looking right through Jesus' eyes to the kingdom, you know? It was just, they are the teaching. I'm not saying they're equal, because they're not. They're different mindsets, different everything. But... They embody the teaching. So, in terms of in terms of embody, I suppose for me, your embodiment has been always looking after those who are at the bottom end of of what well, what we call the bottom end of the society. Um, certainly not what you would call the bottom end of the society, uh, because essentially for you, from what everything you've written and I've seen, um, it's everybody's the same. It really matters not how big your bank balance is or how much you have a, a house or a car or whatever it is. That's not the value of a person. Exactly. And so, in fact, I think that the Shakespeare talked about that. Everyone's uh, blood's the same color. And so, in the end, what was it that drew you particularly to look after those who are the most needy? Because that's me. That's me. That um, I was born in England before the end of World War II. My father... Um, was away at the war, spent a lot of time in Germany, used to work on aeroplanes, all of those sorts of things. And um, my, my mother and my grandmother had a, a sweet shop or a lolly shop in, in, in Hartford. And I was the golden child, the people who came in and all that was the baby and all of that. And my father came home from the war and wanted to be the child. <laughs> and so um, um, there was 
I think he saw me as a threat to my mother or, or you know, and so I had to be stomped on. And it's funny, I've been doing these things and I realise right, 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 right down in the depths of me is a tiny little child hiding in a cave where I went to hide away from my father. Interesting, Harry Potter was at the, in the cupboard at the bottom of the stairs. Same thing. And um, 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 the only way to bring that child out is to love it. And so in lots of ways, I see people who are driven out by society um, like that. So I'm doing that to them, but I'm also, in a way, redeeming myself. I, I, like, I like what you said in terms of redeeming yourself, because I think too often our sense of looking after those who uh, are, are the most needy is more of a response to our own guilt of being not those people than actually really seeing a, a, a process of drawing them out of that cave. Um, and so I think, I think in many ways, that's a much more positive way of looking at the whole process and saying that we're actually facilitating, we're partnering them in their journey. Um, and many of them are in that cave, as you said. I, I found it interesting that you talk about J.K. Rowling because, of course, J.K. Rowling also had a very difficult life uh, before she wrote Harry Potter. In a sense, Harry Potter is, is a little bit of a, uh, maybe a catharsis for her as well, as this boy gets out of the, under, from underneath the, uh, uh, the stairs and actually becomes the one who's able to confront evil in their praise. Do you feel that what you're doing is seeking to confront evil or you're just seeking to give someone a meal? Um, I'm just doing what I'm doing. Um, at, at times, it just hits you. Um, in in my book, well, it when when I was eighteen, I think eighteen, yeah, my brother was terribly killed in a car smash, and it was terrible. And not only that, but there was a whole lot of cover-ups and all of that, because it happened in his country town, and you know the son of the mayor and all of that stuff. And my brother was basically killed terribly. And I was living in Burwood. And I, it freaked that my, a friend came and said, you know, your brother's dead. And my brother and I had always been, had a difficult relationship anyway. And we'd just made up three or four days before. And... I couldn't handle it. I just couldn't handle it. And I freaked out. And I was running around Burwood, I don't know, camps, all that area, like a chook with its head cut off because I didn't know what to do, how to behave. How, what was just awful, beyond awful. And I ended up in this church and I went to see the minister and he was dreadful, dreadful. Not a, beyond dreadful, beyond dreadful, beyond it, just, oh, oh, it was nothing, nothing, nothing. And I walked out of there really angry, which I've held on all this time. And two weeks ago, I was doing a Life Matters story and the person zeroed in on that. And so I got angry, really angry, telling the story again and all the unfairness and how that bloody minister was a waste of space, all of that sort of stuff. And I did that and I came back and I had to do some stuff and it was getting dark and it was time for me to walk home. This is true. So help me God, it's true. And I'm walking home and I'm remembering that interview 
and I'm getting angrier and angrier and in my head, you know. And this guy in a white shirt comes running out of the darkness. Bill, Bill, Bill. Oh, Bill. And I just wanted to say, off, you know. I just want to deal with you. Bill, Bill, Bill. He came up close to me and he goes, my beautiful brother. And I went, oh. He said, yesterday they found his wallet at the top of the cliff. They said, and they've just rung my mum to tell me they found his body. And I just reached out and grabbed him and he shuddered and shook them, all of that. And I kept thinking in my head, I'm not going to be like the body minister. And it was, um, I held him for a long time and he shuddered and shaked and my beautiful brother and my this and my that and the other. And um, um, we held for a long time. And then he eased off a bit and then he said, thank you. And then shut it again and we held it. And then he, um, he said, I'm all right now. I'm all right now. I'm going home to mum and we've got to do all this and do that. And I didn't know what to do, you know. And I got out my card and I said, give you my card because if she wants anyone to bury him, I will. That was all I could think to say. And I saw him about three days later and um, it was, he said, thank you, thank you. I think when things like that happen, um, I find a lot of the gospel stories really a way to deal with all of that, you know. That's what I can say. So that... Um, um, Confronting evil is, you have to, you have to. When I was picking up these kids in King's Cross, right, um, they were talking about being sexually abused by priests and all of that sort of stuff. And I'd take them to the authorities and the authorities would say, no, 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 no. I think all the church leaders of that day should be in jail. They should be in jail for what they let happen. They knew it was going on and they should be in jail. The head of Bernardo's one day, I was bagging Bernardo's because of the pedophiles in it, came to me and said, I know you're speaking the truth, I just wish you wouldn't say it. And it was, and I honestly, over and over, a lot of them in the last year or so, I took to the Royal Commission, you know. The evil is sitting right next to you. <laughs> and it's, I've, I've had to deal with this, you know. I think um, you, you, Human beings are capable of anything, anything from the most wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stuff to the most hideous, apocalyptic, awful stuff. You know, we're all capable of it. We tend to think Australia is really wonderful. Look at what we're doing to that family in Manus Island, you know. Look at what's happened with the soldiers in Afghanistan. All of that sort of stuff. We are just, we, human, each human being is capable of incredible godliness and being the devil incarnate. And once we accept it in ourselves, then we can accept it in others, you know. But you have to stand up to it. So from, from also what you're saying, it sounds like what you also, if I'm, if I'm correct in this, that it's about, not doing the great thing, but sometimes doing the small thing that actually makes the difference in terms of the way in which we live life. It's not, I mean, if we're going to, you know, confronting evil sounds like you're going to go crusade, but we know how those turned out. It wasn't such a good idea. That sometimes, in fact, the smaller thing might be the thing that makes the difference instead. I want to talk a little bit about the book. And uh, you've written a number of books in the past. Um, but when I looked at this book, um, my first reaction to it was to go, what? 12 rules? Come on, he's not writing a self-help book now, is he? We, we had lots of arguments about the cover and all of that and the title. Originally, it was going to be called The Reverend Difficult, but, um, <laughs> but um, they thought this title would sell better because it, 
attracts people. So, um, um, but it, it came about through, because um, I try, usually if people come to me, I usually say yes to whatever because most stuff falls away and then you get really interesting stuff left. And this woman rung me on um, 2GB and she said, um, want to show a movie? Will you? And no, nobody will show it. Will you show it? And I said, yes. And it was about people who are in drug and alcohol addiction who now tell their story. And it's a big film made in America. And 100 people turned up, 100 people. And afterwards, they were all sitting around and they began telling one another their stories. And there was one woman in the front, got in the front, and she said, you know, I came from a really good home, a really good home. I had everything. And then a few years ago, I found myself in a public park in the middle of the night, shooting up heroin with public toilet water. And she said, I thought, what am I doing? And she was talking to 100 people, telling that, telling all her shame, sharing her shame. And I realised when your secrets become a story, they lose their power over you. They lose their power. So many of us have got all these secrets we hold on to because we think nobody will understand all of this sort of stuff. And we hold all these secrets like we're not really insane. Our children aren't really running a ragged. We aren't this, we aren't that. We hold on to all these secrets and they're just stories. And I thought, if she can do that, so can I. And the other thing that happened was at the same time, Hugh McKay had written a book and he was saying the thing people regret most on their deathbed is all the loving things they haven't said to people they feel they should have said it to. And I thought, oh. And so I'd look at people and I'd say to myself, what would I not want to go to my deathbed not having said? And say it. And the combination of being honest and saying things um, changed my life in a way, changed it, opened it out just opened it out and I realised my life is just another story. I had all these shames and this and that and the other and they're just a bloody story. That's all they are, you know, and everybody's like that and it paralyses us and it makes us live lives full of lies, you know. That's, that's yeah, you know, so... so so in a sense, that's the that's the uh, the, the 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 backstory to it. I, I personally, I quite like the previous title uh, because because I I I I think I pride myself on wanting to be difficult, but I'm not really because I'm too scared to be. Um, and yet, when I look at what what you've done and what you've been prepared to do, um, you have been prepared to to be difficult at times, uh, both in the face of of the the church structure. And even in the face of the community itself, in terms of those who would come against some of the things you would do, where, where does the strength come from to do that? The voice told me to. It warned me. And it said, stay true to it. And you stay true to it. And all this stuff comes up. But um, you just do it. And... Um, it's amazing. There are, there are kids who will come up to me or people will come up to me and say, um, you know, um, my life was changed or this or that or the other. And for them, the whole world changed because of things we did or said. Or It's... Um, what, what can I say? Um, the church is just like a bank, really. It's run by bureaucrats who are just like bankers. And... You can't expect bankers to have emotional intelligence and all of this sort of stuff. You can't. You just can't. And um, um, so you just you just do it. You just, what what choice have you got? You just do it. You know. You just do it. You just do it. 
I think I think the it's not about the choice we have, but sometimes the result of not taking some of those choices. I mean, some of the things that you write in the book, and I've, I've only been able to, to, to look at it uh, briefly, um, but some of the things you write in the book are quite confronting in the sense that often the, the lies we believe about ourselves, the lies that we get told, you talked about going into a cave, and yet the one thing that comes out of the book for me was how much you're telling people to get out of the cave and, and, and join something. I mean, join your church, join your local food kitchen, join something. And not just that, but also get someone who you think is useful and, and surround yourself by them so that they can draw you out. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yep, yep, yep. You, you, there's, there's a thing where um, a tree can't grow in sandy soil. It can only grow in really nutrient-rich soil. So you have to find nutrient-rich communities, you know, who will draw you out, who will confront you, who will encourage you, who will do this or do that or do the other. You have, like, the thing I've found is you have to do your religion. And most people don't do it. They think, oh, I'll believe in Jesus and that's enough. It ain't. Sorry, it's not enough. It's not enough because all you are are a clanging gong on top of a mountain top saying, I've been saved by Jesus. Well, who cares? Because there's all these people down there who are drowning or being burned or whatever, and you're doing nothing. Who cares? That's, that's, it's the ultimate selfish, narcissistic thing to get up and say, I am saved and bugger all of you. So in a sense, what you're saying as well, though, is that my act of going to help somebody else is actually the way in which I help myself. So I can fertilize the soil around me by virtue of the way in which I actually reach out to others. And there's a magic in it. There is a magic in it. You don't do it for Jesus. You don't do it for anything else. You just do it. You just do it. I have all these fights with people all the time. The meals are free. Because they're free, the amount of food coming in is endless. We end up on Christmas Day <laughs> with more stuff than we started with, basically because people bring it in. There's a magic. There is a magic in self-giving which um, is holy at its core. And then you can start seeing that in Jesus, if you get what I mean. It doesn't go from top down, it comes from bottom up. Some of the new statistics that's just come out has been that, in fact, it looks as if Australians per capita are actually giving less than what we've given in the past. That we actually, uh, I think it was now at the last uh, tax time, only 29% of Australians actually gave any money to any charities that they claimed. Now, obviously, there's people who give who don't claim, but that's the lowest level that it's ever been in terms of Australia. In terms of the government, um, things like aid is at the lowest level per capita or per, you know, uh, than, than it's also been forever. Are we becoming more stingy as a people? Well, it's both. Um, you'd be amazed at the number of pensioners who got that $750, you know, that, who sent it to us. We got a lot of money that way. They just gave it. And you get all these companies where they got that job keeper and, and gave it to their executives. Like it's like the more you got, the more you hold on to. And the, that's, that's what I find with a, a, a lot of things. You have to be able to give it away. You have to be able to give away that which is most precious to you. If you do that, magic happens. I, I can't explain it any more than that. That, that that's what I've learned. The more you give away, like I, I suppose, look, there's a guy's written a book called Never Split the Difference. And he worked a lot with um, hostage takers in New York where, you know, if you split the difference, the, the hostage at half die. You have to. <laughs> and what he learned was you have to be able to give yourself away. Give yourself away and put yourself 
in the hostage taker's shoes. Put yourself in that person's shoes. Reflect back to that person what you're seeing in that person's shoes. And 10 to 1, he'll give up the victim and more. Over and, and Jesus says that all the time. Give yourself away. Give away what is most precious to you. If you give away what's most precious to you, it comes back. If you hold on to it, it runs forever. There was a guy rung me up because he's got a, a wild fowl or something in his backyard, you know, and the, the mum wild fowl chucked all the chickens out of the nest and they're all screaming because they've got to go away, you know. Most of us hold on to our kids. We hold on to them so we make them neurotic. You know what I mean? And I've, you have to, if you've got something that's really precious to you, you have to be prepared to give it away. And then you realise the true value of it. And you actually share the true value of it with the other person, you know? And that's another thing I've, I've really had to learn the hard way. That, that, and all the religions say that. Give it up, 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 you know? I think as much as I didn't like the 12 rules, because I'm, I'm not really big into rules, what I like is the second half, which said to a better life. And I like, I like that in terms of the better life in the sense, and I think maybe you've just explained what you mean by better life, is that that life which, which isn't all about the attachments, that life isn't all about the stuff that we have, even the relationships, because those relationships are good only in the way in which we allow them to grow and to develop in themselves. And I think I, think I like that as, as a concept, that it's not the best life, not the fulfilled life, not the, 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 the full life, but the better life. And it's almost from what I was reading between the lines of how much the better life is all about how we, what we do to others rather than what we do for ourselves. It's, it's, it's what we are now, not in the future. It's now, you know, that um, so much of our, we plan for the future and we do this, and we do that. And all these people who planned and built houses and, Bushfire came through, blew it all away, all of that sort of stuff. Um, nothing like that is permanent, you know. And um, it's, it's, it's a better life. I, I, a better life isn't a life with more stuff, you know. Rennie Rivkin used to say, he who dies with the most wins, you know. And we kind of live by that, you know. And yet it doesn't work. It doesn't. When, when my second marriage busted up, my relationship with my kids um, fell to pieces, you know, and it took me years and years and years to rebuild it. And I rebuilt it by um, learning a whole lot of stuff about myself, partly, but also um, not trying to hold on to them as children, but letting them come back to me. Well, it's difficult. It's hard. None of this is easy. A better life isn't an easy life. I think that's the mistake we make. We think a better life is an easier life. It's just a life where you're more at home with yourself, you know, and you don't, and you're less, you're less um, um, uh, susceptible to shame. So many of us are, are afraid of shame, you know, and we'll do anything not to be shamed. You know? <laughs> when it's just funny. <laughs> and and I, I love I love what you were saying in terms of that, that that shame when you start sharing that story takes away its power. And therefore there's no there's no shame in the story, there's just the story. And and if we tell that story well, as you've done in the book, that's actually catharsis both for us and for the people reading it. I think that's a good place for us to start. And so can we say thank you very much to, to Bill? <laughs>